Namaskar. Today in our conversations from the ground, we have a discussion with Dr. Sunita Krishnan. Dr. Krishnan is the co-founder of the organization Prajwala. She is well known nationally and internationally as a human rights activist and for the tremendous work she has done in preventing and responding to trafficking in persons and rescuing thousands of girls and women from lives of slavery. Um, she is also the recipient of the fourth highest civilian national award, Padam Shri, given by the government of India. I personally have known Dr. Krishnan since 2002, and as always, it gives me great pleasure to have this discussion with her. When we had met at one of the consultations you and ODC had organized in 2019, and when we met in Hyderabad last summer, you had mentioned that uh, you know the trafficking in persons related dimensions have changed so much over the recent times that even the skilled expert responders um, uh, from the civil society like yourself are feeling skill challenged. Now, that was the situation about uh, almost a year ago. Now, with uh, the, the COVID health crisis and the lockdown and the dimensions which will change on the ground uh, slowly in the coming future, what are the kind of skills that you think are very necessary for the, the civil society experts to have to be able to respond uh, in line with what the ground requires. What are the emerging scenarios like uh, online grooming? And I think your sentence at that point was in fact related to uh, online grooming and, and the social media and how the traffickers are reaching out not just to those who are lesser educated, but in fact, um, uh, reaching out to also those who are from cities and who are uh, from the segments we consider to be more aware and more educated. So how do you see these challenges uh, and these skills for the responders changing in the coming months? Deepika ji, one of the things that I would look, like to look at COVID crisis both as a challenge and as an opportunity. Uh, at one end, when we talk about challenges, we are now talking about um, un unbelievable proportions of uh, more vulnerable communities and vulnerable people. The economic devastation that is going to follow this car crisis is going to make the vulnerable much, much more vulnerable. I mean, um, already we have a situation in India with uh, a good, good number of, um, a significant number of girls, especially in sex trafficking and labor trafficking also, who are, uh, you know, due to optionless and very choiceless situation, uh, sold by their own families because that's the kind of, uh, you know, level of impoverishment the family goes through. But with this crisis, that is kind of going to increase hundredfold. And therefore, uh, you know, any human being and uh, especially a girl child will be the easiest disposable commodity in the family to sustain and survive. Um, that is at one end from the from the ground part of it. Another end is all of us, including what we are doing right now. We are all going virtual. We are all going online and we are all now do everything on Zoom and Skype and all these online stuff. Uh, more and more online classes have begun for children. And suddenly a whole world of children as young as six and seven are now being given access to the Internet and um, to actually uh, ensure and facilitate online classes. Their parents have to give them either iPads or phones or things like that and they facilitate that. Now, how many parents can actually sit and monitor what is happening, whether the classes are happening, which is, which means that they have to sit throughout the day or throughout the hours that the classes are happening. So uh, there is a significant in increase in online child sexual abuse of material, which means that there is a significant increase in online uh, cyber trafficking. Um, the skills for which we never had before um, adequately and now with the kind of numbers that we are going to deal with, uh, we are going to be kind of boomeranged with huge, huge numbers from all strata of society. Mm -hmm. Now, while these are the various risks that we can look at or the challenges that we are looking at through COVID crisis, I also would look at COVID crisis as an opportunity. 
there has been restricted mobility between the states, between the districts. Uh, the lockdown is the fourth phase of the lockdown has begun. If all the first responders, especially the anti-human trafficking responders, are now trained and skilled, and uh, of course the only way you can do it is again through an online way, on the various you know indicators uh, which one has to look out for at the borders, uh, maybe the physical trafficking of human beings for labor, uh, for various other forms of exploitation could be very, very uh, effectively, you know, monitored and there could be very, very uh, increased vigilance on that because right now with restricted mobility, we can still put in place certain do's and don'ts and a whole checklist of things which mm -hmm. we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, right now, all our police officers or people who are manning the borders, they know only to check whether they have the pass or they have whatever is the document necessary for a for an inter-district transfer or an interstate transfer. More than that, nobody is looking in. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, and other than seeing whether there's a thermal check or, you know, uh, checking whether it's a migrant and they have all their papers or whatever, you know, some very, very limited to covid if we can expand it to, because now with, you know, 4 lakh, 5 lakh migrant workers from every state trying to go back to their uh, to home states, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it is so much more easier to actually smuggle people away. So mm -hmm. now if we can actually teach them some, and what, what we require at this moment and very urgently, I would say, um, at, 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 at a war footing is very clear, very clear, unambiguous, you know, checklists of indicator. Mm -hmm. At the ground mm -hmm. level, the PC, the constable needs to know what is that one thing that he has to see, you know, so that mm -hmm. we can, you can keep things. Because now is the time to may maybe uh, strengthen our borders. Mm -hmm. Now is the time to maybe, you know, we may, we can, we can, you know, this could be the greatest opportunity to plug interstate trafficking mm -hmm. because, you know, in, in, in a country like India, the larger problem, at least around 90% of the problem is interstate or intrastate. Mm -hmm. And right now, both interstate and intrastate, everything is blocked. You know, neither you can move from one district to another, nor you can move from one state to another. Right. How how do we make this situation? How do we take make, make this to our advantage? How do we take it? Uh, you know, you know, turn it around, and you know, uh, and make very quick. You know, apply our minds very quickly and create those very small small list of not very complicated. You know, we don't need big modules. We don't need big big training modules and things like that. We need simple indicators. You know, mm -hmm. where people can be told, this is what you have to see. These are the indicators. This is what should, you know, alert your antenna. And this is how you will respond and inform the right thing. Mm -hmm. Which also means that we need to strengthen a whole chain of responders. So thank you very much, Sunita Ji. I completely agree with you um, on the point that, you know, this uh, the health crisis that we are facing is perhaps also uh, an opportunity that has been given to us to at least fill in the gaps in the systems which so far we have not been able to do because now we have a reason which is imperative uh, to do so. Uh, so, um, you know, what this requires is also, I think, partnerships at different ends because what we've been seeing and, and at least Prajwala and yourself and in, in different roles currently with UNODC, but also in the past with other organizations. I remember the first time I had met you was in 2003, when this whole dialogue about you know trafficking in persons in South Asia and, and cross-border and within India was perhaps still at the nascent stages. And now, uh, almost 20 years down the line, we are still uh, facing similar challenges. What we have seen is that the plethora of responders has increased the number of people working on it has increased the awareness among the responders has increased but again there are 
many agencies which are working on similar issues, many government departments, many UN agencies, also a lot of civil society groups and individual experts, lawyers, and so on. Somewhere there is that coordination which needs to be enhanced. Now, you know, the coordination is required at the central level, at the state level, as well as the local levels. But from, from your experience, do you think going forward as we uh, get through, get over with this fourth uh, uh, session of the lockdown, where are the three key areas where coordination is absolutely necessary, at what levels and between which sectors? At least for the near term, if we plan uh, to strengthen our responses within the next year or so, what are the three priorities, a priority areas, levels, and sectors where you think we should focus our attention? Thank you. Deepika ji, there are a couple of areas where we, uh, we are falling short of, whether it is in cooperation, collaboration, or convergence. Um, and uh, while there, there have been an increased number of players um, in, in, in the anti-human trafficking domain, you will also notice that on the ground, there are not many. So mm -hmm. while uh, there is there's a whole world of people who have actually now recognized trafficking perhaps as a very good, uh, uh, I don't want to sound cynical, but uh, as, as a good ground for setting up the organizations and talking about it. But when, when it comes to uh, actually how many people in the country are doing, say, frontline work with the enforcement agencies for rescue work, you will start counting them on our fingertips. Um, how many people are providing protection services uh, and uh, very specialized protection services for trafficked victims, whether it is for labor trafficked or it is sex trafficked, again, you will start counting it on your fingertips. So there's gap at every level at the actual response. Where is this uh, absolutely singularly no gap at all at the talking level, mm -hmm. at the conference level, and at the um, uh, conversation level. But at mm -hmm. the action level, there's several gaps. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, and perhaps the gaps uh, is also because um, there are now not many, many organizations who are investing on protection services. Um, uh, rehabilitation continues to be the biggest gap then now. Um, uh, so uh, uh, re-trafficking continues to be a big, big challenge then now. Mm -hmm. So while the visibility of the problem has increased, uh, the responses in, actual, in terms of actual, um, you know, responses to uh, combat and create a whole mechanism, a framework of care, protection, and, you know, uh, a framework to combat the problem in the real sense is not happening. And um, uh, while at the legal level we have our gaps in terms of we don't have a comprehensive legislation, at the law and level, we don't have a, you know, sustained concerted mechanism to, uh, you know, ensure that enforcement agencies are doing this work uh, mm -hmm. and they are monitored and they are, you know, there is a kind of a logical conclusion in, so if there are, uh, say, uh, 3,000 children rescued during Operation Muskan, then you go backward, how many cases were registered, you don't see much. Mm -hmm. Then you put it down, how many charge sheets, then how many trials, and then how many convicted. You're coming to absolutely poor numbers there. Mm -hmm. So that means that a lot of things is happening, but it's not reaching its logical conclusion. That means that ev at every level of response, there's a huge gap. If there is a rescue, then there is no corresponding rehab and protection mechanism put in place. So mm -hmm. hundreds and thousands of kids are being rescued every year under Operation Smile and things like that. Um, they could be labor traffic. They are under labor exploitation. All of them are just sent back to their families. A whole mm -hmm. chain of redrafting continues. You know, they go from mm -hmm. this end, come back from that end. Similar mm -hmm. is the case of sex trafficking. Um, so if you if you look at the actual number of say victims. 
uh, or survivors getting compensation, getting justice, actual conviction happening in these cases, then you will see a huge, huge gap. Mm-hmm. So there is there, there are plugs at the enforcement level that needs to be plugged. There's you know uh, loopholes at the judiciary level that needs to be plugged. There is loopholes at the protection services level that needs to be plugged, which means that all these stakeholders a have to be empowered with skills, b supported and with resources, and three brought together at very clear action-based plan to work mm-hmm. and network together. I thank you, um, Sunita, uh, for sharing your views on this. Um, I think uh, I, I completely uh, um, agree with you that coordination needs to be enhanced at different levels, and we at UNODC have been saying that also for many, many years. But um, I think we have to also look at it very carefully as to coordination at what level. And you rightly say that coordination on the ground where the work needs to happen is where it's perhaps lacking. And of course, having uh, a normative framework around which a mechanism can be set up for that work to be made easier um, uh, for all the sectors uh, to focus on is, is another need. So there, I agree with you that a lot more needs to be done. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the challenge remains as large as it was earlier, perhaps with different dimensions. Perhaps we take a little bit of heart in the knowledge that uh, you know, some responders um, have actively been working in geographical areas where there was no focus earlier. The scale of the responders have also been in, uh, increasing. And perhaps uh, to a certain extent, the number of different actors is, is also um, uh, a, a good, good area, good area uh, if coordination can be improved. Um, I will end today's conversation asking for you at your personal level when you talk about reintegration and rehabilitation of a survivor of trafficking. Okay, uh, let me break this question into two parts. One is what for you uh, is, is the distinction between a victim and a survivor? That's the first question. Second part of this is that how would you define uh, rehabilitation and reintegration of a survivor of trafficking? Because often I see or I hear that, uh, you know, getting a girl uh, married off and uh, sending her to a village like you said in the instance that she's been married and she's gone off and it becomes someone else's issue to deal with is, is constituted as rehabilitation. And at, at a very individual, at a very gendered level, that is something that I personally find very, very problematic as well. But I want to hear your personal view. How would you define the right rehabilitation of the survivors? And how can we generate champions from within this group of survivors themselves so that for the future generations who come out with this fight winning have someone to look up to from their own, so to speak. Thank you. Deepika ji, for me, victim and survivor are two two different faces in the same person's life. Um, 34, 35 years back, I was a victim of gang rape. I am a survivor of gang rape today. So these are faces in person's life. There's a point when you are you are so traumatized, you are not able to see things clearly, you need all the support, you need hand holding, you need you need everybody to, you know, uh, give you kind of a, a safety net to cope up. And that's a kind of a phase where you're a victim. The day you can start seeing your strength the day you can start seeing yourself, the day you can start standing up for yourself, that's a day when you start becoming a survivor. So for me, victimhood and becoming a survivor are different phases in the same person's life. Mm-hmm. Having said that, what what is rehabilitation? I think it is also connected with these two words, victim and survivor. Because for me, rehabilitation is a combination of three different things. One is uh, the psychological coping mechanisms, um, whether the person has got psychological 
um, strength and coping skills to to be to to trigger her inner healing to to overcome what all she has gone through in in the hell holes that he or she has been subjected to um coming out of that coping with that and able to see your own self and recognize yourself and actually owning your identity that's a whole world of psychological rehabilitation we are talking about it's about counseling it's about trauma care it's about psychosocial intervention it's about a whole lot of psychotherapeutic processes that mm -hmm. would create a kind of a safe safe net environment for a person to heal and develop those coping skills which are emotional skills social skills and psychological skills which will help you regain back yourself that's one part of rehabilitation the other part of rehabilitation is to gather those very very um important skills that will be help you in living in this material world whether it is education whether it is employment whether it's employability skills so whole world of skills related to your uh, you know survival and existence in in the world which means that if if this person has to get out that person need has to have a very clear understanding i know this i can do this so that building those skills comes under my economic rehabilitation or educational rehabilitation rehabilitation is a combination of psychological rehabilitation economic rehabilitation and civic rehabilitation which empowers a person to very you know confidently go back to the society at her own terms and conditions so it's not about marriage mm -hmm. if she chooses to come, you know get married that's her choice but that's not about marriage but it's about mm -hmm. this person gaining that confidence to live back in a society in in a non harmful space working at her at her terms and conditions and living her life to the fullest with dignity that for me is rehabilitation mm -hmm. and if as in when that person gains that and as in when that person you know gains a confidence to step out and deal with the society with all its stigma ostracization and everything you know it's not about changing names and identity and things like that but living your life lifefully the day she feels or he feels comfortable to go back to the society that is the day we call i would say is the right indicator for social reintegration so i don't believe that a person to be removed from one place of exploitation and handed over to their families is rehabilitation i don't believe in that in fact i i call it retrafficking for me rehabilitation is a long process a lengthy process and it requires several responders to support from the civil society organization to the department of women and child welfare to various other agencies like the banks the uidi dai uh, to the government to the district administration and also um, uh, Uh, perhaps the government in terms of the policies that they would create and and make in but all this does not it is not complete fully if justice is not restored to her mm -hmm. and you know i have seen that have are among our girls every stage when they give their 164 statement the the way they stand up and their head lifts up when they go on to the trial and actually testify you know step by step the day they gave the 164 the day they identified the accused the day they went to trial every step something of theirs is getting rebuilt the mm. day the conviction you have to see the sense of pride and the sense of confidence with which the person stands and says now i can live my life freely you know that that inner liberty to me is reintegration thank you very much sunita ji i um, agree with um, the points that you have shared here and uh, um, i have a lot more questions and observations which i want to continue having the dialogue with you but in the interest of time the today's conversation we will stop here and um hopefully we will soon meet again in uh, another one of our events which 
um, we aim will not be just another one of the sounding boards or online conversations in-person conversation, but something which leads to action on the ground. But in the meantime, all that is left for me to do is, is to wish you well uh, and uh, safety for you, your team, um, your family, and your girls while you're dealing with the COVID-19 situation on the ground. Uh, we wish you well, and we thank you again on behalf of UNODC for sharing your valuable time and your opinions and your views with us. Thank you, Sunita Ji, and Namaskar.